Hi, my name is Benjamin Ellingson. I'm a professor of radiology, psychiatry, and neurosurgery at UCLA. And today I'm going to talk briefly about imaging modalities that we use for GBM monitoring. These are my disclosures. So what I hope to accomplish in, in, in briefly in 10 minutes here is to briefly discuss about what the imaging modalities use most often for GBM response assessment. First, I'm going to go into a little detail about the basic response assessment, the renal criteria or the modified renal criteria the basis of which is really just pre and post contrast T1 weighted images. And then I hope to get into some specific techniques that might be useful for focused ultrasound studies, including dynamic contrast enhanced MRI that we can use to look for vascular permeability changes. Contrast enhanced uh, T1 weighted digital subtraction maps, we can look at steady state vascular permeability. And then lastly, discuss briefly dynamic susceptibility contrast MRI that can give us an estimate of blood volume, blood flow, and even vessel size. So just to start, uh, T1 weighted images are those MRI sequences that have a short echo time and a short TR, and this results in T1 weighting within the image signal. Short T1 ends up being bright on T1 weighted images. And so prior to the administration of contrast, things like blood products and, and other things shorten T1, and we can see it on the image here, some blood products actually within the lesion. After administration of contrast, uh, primarily gadolinium-based contrast agents, vascular permeability causes this contrast to extravasate from the intravascular to the extravascular space. This results in shortening of T1 of the surrounding water as contrast agent uh, diffuses from the vasculature into the extravascular space. This shortens T1 and results in uh, brightening of the surrounding water and highlighting the area of abnormal vascularity that we use as a surrogate. Now we've been using um, contrast enhancement to as a surrogate of tumor burden in GBM for quite a long time. Uh, it was confirmed surgically in a variety of studies to contain the most aggressive uh, uh, areas of the tumor. Contrast enhancing tumor size and the extent of resection of that contrast enhancing component is highly correlated uh, with the overall survival and prognosis in these patients. This is a study that we conducted a, a meta-analysis pooling data from thousands of patients in both the newly diagnosed and the recurrent GBM uh, setting. And as you can see, the larger the tumor burden uh, after surgery, the uh, shorter the overall survival. Now this led to development of what was known as the McDonald criteria in 1990 uh, for, in order for us to look at response assessment in, in malignant gliomas. These were improvements upon previous criteria like the Levin criteria and the WHO uh, criteria in that it looks at contrast enhancement and looks at bi-directional measurements of the contrast enhancing lesion. And this was really maintained as the standard response assessment for over 20 years. In 2010, uh, Patrick Wen in the Reno Working Group uh, uh, developed or adapted or improved upon the McDonald criteria. And the renal criteria now uh, is largely thought of as being an extended version of the McDonald criteria. This includes also qualitative assessments of T2 and flare hyperintensity to look at non-enhancing tumor components, as well as other improvements, including the definition of measurable, non-measurable disease, new inclusion and exclusion criteria, uh, and other improvements. Now, just briefly, the uh, renal criteria defines uh, a number of response categories. Complete response here is where all target lesions, all contrast enhancing measurable lesions have disappeared. Uh, partial response is where all of those target lesions have decreased or the sum of the product diameter has decreased more than 50% from the baseline. Uh, progressive disease is when the contrast enhancing lesion, the sum of the product diameters, has increased more than 25% from the lowest or nadir value. And then stable disease is everywhere kind of in between. Now a modification of the renal criteria was developed in, in 2017 by a number of investigators. And this was really designed to be adaptive uh, or, or for adaptive or bucket trials that may have a variety of types of therapeutics, immunotherapies or anti-angiogenic therapies that can dramatically alter uh, contrast and, and lesion size just simply from their mechanism of action. Uh, this criteria allows patients to safely stay on drug uh, and allows uh, patients to basically have initial progressive enhancement, uh, but they stay on trial past that in order for us to uh, look for evidence of, of, of uh, mechanism. Here's a schema 
uh, just highlighting the modified renal uh, criteria here, where here we have uh, in recurrent GBM, we have the baseline image. After the initial progressive enhancement, we have a preliminary PD event. This would be normally when a patient would be taken off study once their tumor has uh, reached this threshold of progressive disease. But unlike the standard renal criteria, the modified renal criteria allows the patients to stay on trial for another cycle uh, and to confirm whether or not there's actually progressive disease or if the tumor size has stabilized or shrunk, uh, we would confirm pseudoprogression or PSP here and the patient would be uh, would continue on therapy. Uh, just as an example of how this works, we just finished up a phase two convection enhanced trial uh, of uh, MDNA 5505 in recurrent GBM where contrast and the drug was administered uh, using convection enhanced delivery. You can see uh, where the drug was delivered by uh, um, after the end of infusion here because we actually mixed uh, the drug with gadolinium based contrast agents. And you can see by day 30 relative to the planning or baseline that the lesion has grown substantially. Uh, but with the modified renal criteria, we are allowed to keep patients on study a lot longer. Uh, and you can see the lesion actually stabilized and the patient went on to live for more than 480 days in the recurrent setting, uh, which is well beyond what was expected. The other important factor is that uh, when looking at measures of progression-free survival uh, and including patients that uh, were allowed to stay on study past the initial progressive disease event, we can actually see a nice correlation between progressive-free survival and overall survival. Um, so we think that this might be a good surrogate uh, of early efficacy uh, in recurrent GBM. Now, using the change in contrast enhancement as a surrogate has also been sort of the standard for more than 50 years, as I mentioned, the McDonald criteria, but even precursors to that have really used, uh, you know, alterations or changes in the size of the contrast enhancing lesion uh, as, as uh, a surrogate of response. So a variety of single or multi-center studies have used change in lesion size as a surrogate endpoint. Uh, whether that's time to progression, progress and pre-survival, overall response rate, uh, or other uh, endpoints. And really prospective phase one to phase three trials and recurrent malignant gliomas, including GBM, uh, often use contrast enhancement uh, or change in contrast enhancing tumor size as a surrogate of treatment efficacy. And there's a variety of, of references and examples of that in the literature. Now, there are some exceptions that we know that and this is really treatments that alter vascular permeability. So we know that alterations in steroid dose, for example, changes uh, vascular permeability and also changes the measured tumor size. Because again, we are relying on contrast to leak into the extravascular space and using that as a surrogate of the underlying disease. We also know that agents that, uh, uh, that like anti-angiogenic or anti-VEGF therapies that are known to target tumor vasculature uh, also decrease vascular permeability, and we also see masking of the amount of contrast enhancement independent of underlying tumor burden. Lastly, on, on sort of the flip side, we know that early changes in contrast enhancement due to breakdown of epithelial cells, uh, due to inflammatory response or pseudoprogression, um, or um, potentially focused ultrasound could increase uh, artificially the size of the enhancing lesion um, uh, independent of true tumor burden. So now looking at uh, focused ultrasound studies, you know, we expect an increase in vascular permeability, vasodilation and blood flow just simply from the literature. Um, so you can see here in this uh, little diagram here in the area where we see the focused ultrasound on and the, the micro bubbles here, we see an, an alteration in vascular permeability uh, as the mechanism of action of this certain therapy. You can see in this study here, these are T1 weighted images after administration of focused ultrasound. And you can see at baseline here, no contrast enhancement. And then you can see in the area of, of focused ultrasound, you see an increase in the amount of, of contrast enhancement within that area. So how can we quantify vascular permeability if we think that this is a mechanism of action uh, for focused ultrasound? So to do that, uh, we have an eloquent tool called Dynamic Contrast Enhanced MRI. We know that uh, we rely on the contrast agents or gadolinium-based contrast agents to leak out into the extravascular space. Here we see some dynamic T1-weighted images as a function of time, and you can see that just as you follow uh, uh, after injection of contrast, you can see that the contrast leaks out in the extravascular space, 
and you see pooling and reabsorption over time. So we can use a, a two compartment pharmacokinetic model, uh, which is the basis of dynamic contrast enhanced MRI to model the exchange of contrast between the plasma or blood space uh, and the extravascular extracellular space. And the rate in which uh, contrast moves from the vascular to the extravascular space, that transport constant is called K-trans, uh, and the reuptake constant is called KEP. If you look at the signal intensity as a function of time, you see early wash-in phase, and that really is related to vascular permeability, vessel surface area or capillary surface area, as well as blood flow. Uh, the washout rate is related to a variety of other factors, including compartmentalization, volume fraction, and other things. So really this measure of K-trans is thought to be uh, an early surrogate of, of vascular permeability as contrast washes out from the vascular to the extravascular space. Here you can see uh, representative T2 weighted, post-contrast T1 weighted images, and a K-trans map showing heterogeneity of the amount of leakage or permeability of contrast, even within this relatively homogeneously enhancing lesion. And so observed concentration of, of, of our contrast agent uh, can then be modeled using uh, standard approaches for pharmacokinetic modeling. Now there is precedent in the literature for uh, using this approach for uh, focused ultrasound studies. So this is a study from 2020 uh, from McMahon here showing that after um, uh, focused ultrasound in microbeads, we see in about 15 minutes, we see an increase in the amount of K-trans here. Uh, in this particular study, they were given dexamethasone or saline, and you can see that within two hours, uh, that K-trans is dramatically reduced. This is just the same uh, image data here showing on the top here, 15 minutes after focused ultrasound, you see an increase in um, K-trans or this vascular permeability uh, surrogate. And then after the administration of death, dexamethasone, you see uh, some reduction in the size as well as uh, the magnitude of K-trans. And again, after two hours, you see some sort of resolution uh, or sealing back up of the blood-brain barrier. This is another study uh, from 2014, uh, again, showing the time evolution uh, of focused ultrasound changes in vascular permeability. Here you see two different uh, intensities of that focused ultrasound, showing that at higher intensities, we see an increase, uh, a more dramatic increase in K-trans, again, the vascular permeability forward rate constant. And you can see it uh, evolving over time. And e even at 24 hours, you can see resealing of the blood-brain barrier uh, according to the surrogate K-trans. Now, another sort of uh, a poor man's way of, of, of looking at vascular permeability uh, would be using T1 subtraction maps. So this is uh, an old technology that was really used uh, in order to look for hemorrhage uh, or look at contrast enhancement and uh, tumor burden, even in the presence of blood products and other issues. Um, so you can see here pre-contrast T1 weighted images with some blood products and post-surgical changes, post-contrast T1 weighted images here uh, where, that contain both blood products as well as uh, new contrast enhancement uh, from, uh, from the disease itself. And then you see the T1 subtraction maps highlighting only the areas uh, that are new after administration of contrast. And here you can see another representative post-surgical image uh, showing that the entire uh, outside of this uh, lesion is still contrast enhancing. Here's yet another example here where we see the pre-contrast, the post-contrast T1 weighted images here where we see a little blush of contrast enhancement here. But by subtracting these two, we can actually see uh, where we have contrast accumulation uh, within, uh, you know, within the brain or within the, within the lesion at sort of a steady state uh, uh, time point. Here's just another example here, the traditional post-contrast T1 weighted image. And you can here you can see this whole area is, has altered vascular permeability. So again, there is precedent in the focused ultrasound literature for using this approach. Uh, this was that same study uh, from 2014, here just showing uh, as it, with two different intensities of the focused ultrasound that using the subtraction map, subtracting off the pre-contrast T1 weighted images, you can see the area of contrast enhancement here uh, that's highlighted uh, over time. Here's another study uh, from 2017. Again, this is a T2 weighted image, and this is the T1 weighted subtraction map. And you can see it, it, it uh, very well delineates the area of increased vascular permeability um, as a function of time 
uh, after focused ultrasound. Lastly, I want to talk about a technology uh, called dynamic susceptibility contrast MRI that's used ubiquitously in, 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 in brain imaging as well as uh, uh, brain tumor imaging. And what this is, is a dynamic T2 star weighted image uh, uh, modality where we're going to collect a series of, 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 of dynamic or a time series of T2 star weighted images during the injection and first pass of a contrast agent through the vasculature. And so this uh, dynamic series is converted to a change in uh, relaxation rate that's proportional to contrast agent concentration. We then integrate this uh, first pass time curve, and what we're left with is measures of cerebral blood flow and blood volume, depending on the delay and, and uh, the total blood volume. Now, we know that contrast agents leak out into the extravascular space. That's the whole basis of both DCE MRI and the use of post-contrast T1-weighted images uh, as a surrogate of in GBM and other malignant gliomas. So uh, in most DSC MRI studies, we have to use some sort of leakage correction because an underlying assumption of this approach uh, is that all of the contrast stays within the vasculature. And so we are able to use a very similar two-compartment pharmacokinetic model in order to account for contrast agent uh, exchange between the vascular component and the extravascular component, just like DCE MRI. So we're able to quantify K-trans and some of these other parameters very similarly. The other thing that we can do is um, we can use an approach called vessel size imaging that looks at a, uh, a more sophisticated way of, of, of acquiring the data as the contrast agent passes through the vasculature in order to estimate mean vessel diameter. So we know that uh, from the literature that focused ultrasound results in vasodilation as well as alterations in blood flow. Uh, so this might be a way that we can actually image and quantify uh, changes in vessel caliber or vessel diameter um, resulting from focused ultrasound studies. So just in summary, there's a, a variety of imaging technologies that might be useful for studying focused ultrasound. Many of them have been in practice uh, preclinically. The basic response assessment that we use in GBM really has to do with pre and post contrast T1 weighted imaging and the overall size of that abnormal component. Now there are ways of mitigating uh, sort of false positives and false negatives using the modified renal criteria in order for us to allow patients to stay on study past some initial progressive disease or progressive uh, enhancement event that we think might be artifactual. Uh, and then there's a variety of other imaging techniques that are a little bit more advanced that we could use uh, for targeted focused ultrasound studies in order to quantify vascular permeability changes, uh, blood volume, blood flow, and uh, vessel size or, or vasodilation studies uh, that can easily be incorporated into clinical trials uh, in humans in order to study uh, some of the mechanisms of action. With that, I want to thank you for your attention um, and uh, hope to answer any questions.